name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning's gospel lesson, we pick up where we left off actually two weeks ago. And if you paid attention to the, to the gospel readings, you'll notice that today's gospel lection is, for, is the lesson for the seventh Sunday of Luke. Last week's lesson, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, was actually for the fifth Sunday of Luke. And the Sunday prior to that, October 24th, was the lesson for the sixth Sunday of Luke, when we heard about Christ's healing of the Gadarene demoniac. And so the readings at this time of year sometimes get a little jumbled. And um, the reason for this kind of jumbling of the readings is kind of interesting, so if you'll permit me a little rabbit trail. Uh, in 472, Mount Vesuvius erupted. Um, this was, of course, the famous, um, the famous a volcano near Naples in Italy. And this eruption took place over the course of November 5th and November 6th of that year. And the, the, the repercussions of that eruption was felt as far away as Constantinople, which is some 750 miles away as the crow flies. It was reported that molten magma and great clouds of ash fell on the imperial city during these two days, causing widespread destruction and damage, all of which inspired the people to repent, to flock to the churches, to seek God, thinking that the end of days was upon them. And so the church, in her wisdom, then assigned this gospel account of the, the fifth Sunday of St. Luke, the gospel account of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, uh, uh, to always be read on the Sunday that precedes the week during the anniversary of this disaster. And in fact, we move it whenever it's necessary to move it to make so that that Sunday that precedes the week is always the reading of that parable in order to remind us all to repent the way that the people did in Constantinople in the year 472. Basically, the church gives us a reminder of hell during a week when the people thought that fire was raining from the sky. So it's a very practical lesson for those church fathers are pretty crafty. So picking up from two weeks ago, Jesus has returned to Galilee, that's his home base, from the country of the Gadarenes, where you recall that he'd healed this demoniac and he sent demons into the herd of swine. A great crowd gathers to welcome him to the region because he had been preaching and working miracles all around Galilee. So just like we do today, when there's some kind of a spectacle, people gather around to see what's going to happen. The same thing happened in Galilee back then. Crowds would gather around Jesus to see what was going to happen because nobody ever knew what might happen. So all of these signs and wonders began to occur right after Jesus had been baptized and had been tempted by Satan in the wilderness for 40 days. And St. Luke tells us that he returned to Galilee from the desert in the power of the Spirit. And the fruit of that power is what we see in today's gospel lesson. So in the midst of this multitude, Jairus, an official of the synagogue, approaches the Lord in great distress. His only daughter, a young girl about 12 years old, lay sick and dying. And he falls to his knees before Jesus, and he begs him to come to his home to save her. And it's a very moving scene, of course. And Jesus, the compassionate one, responds immediately and turns to go to his house. In the midst of this drama, a remarkable thing happens. A woman who had suffered from a long-term and grave illness steals her way through this massive crowd and manages to touch the hem of the Lord's garment, and she's instantly healed. Today's gospel account recounts the faith of two people, Jairus and the woman with this issue of blood. But this morning, I want us to focus on the woman. St. Luke doesn't tell us the name of the woman, but holy tradition tells us that this is St. Veronica. This is the very same woman who later, make, later met Jesus as he was struggling to bear his cross on the Via Dolorosa on his way out of Jerusalem to Golgotha in the crucifixion. And our Lord stopped in exhaustion um, near Veronica's house, and she rushed over bringing a cloth with which he wiped his bruised and beaten face. And the image of our Lord's face remained on that cloth, and it became the prototype for the icon that we know today as the mandilion, which is just a Greek word that means towel. It is also called the icon made without hands because its archetype was not painted by an iconographer. We have a really beautiful example I've put out into the nave over here of this particular icon, if you see it, um, it's, it's a really, this is a lovely Russian example of this icon. St. Luke, who was a physician and always in, was interested to know 
uh, the physical details of Christ's miraculous healings must have interviewed Veronica at some point after the incident that was recounted in today's gospel because he fills the story with such amazing detail. So we know that her illness involved a hemorrhage of blood and that it afflicted her for 12 years. And we know that she spent all of her money on doctors and treatments. We also know from the Old Testament law, in Leviticus 15 to be precise, that this woman would have been considered ritually unclean due to this illness. Under the Mosaic law, she would have been forced to live apart from the community. She could not worship at the temple. She could not come to the synagogue. She could not shop in the marketplace. She could not visit with family or friends. And anything and anyone that came in physical contact with her would also have been considered ritually unclean and subject to a lengthy ritual of purification. And the penalty, should she be caught in a public place, was stoning. She was destitute, scared, sick, and alone, and her circumstances were, must have been overwhelming. Nevertheless, she threw all caution to the wind in desperation, and even though she knows it could result in her death, her faith drives her forward, and she reaches out with a single-minded determination, risking everything just to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. Then if you can imagine it, a huge crowd of people surging forward to accompany Jesus to Jairus' home, excited at the prospect of being able to witness a miraculous healing, or maybe to be able to witness the teacher being embarrassed. Um, Jesus comes to a halt, and he exclaims, Who touched me? And he must have used a very loud voice, because you can imagine this crowd must have been noisy, and otherwise he would not have been heard. And Peter, as is so often in these gospel accounts, is perplexed by this question. What do you mean, who touched you? There's a whole crowd of people pressing around you, jostling you. Many people are touching you. But Jesus wasn't just asking whose hand had touched him, but rather, who is it that touched him with faith? Power has gone out for me, he said in response to this particular touch. It's remarkable. There was something different about this woman's touch. There was intent behind it. There was faith behind it that made her context significant so significant that it coaxed power to proceed from Christ, and this woman's life was miraculously changed. So why does Jesus ask, who touched me? He is, after all, we're going to say this in the creed in just a few moments, very God, very God. He's of one essence with the all-knowing Father. He knows who it is that touched him, but he asked this question in order to reveal this woman's faith, to draw our attention to her action and its result. Christ wants us to remember Veronica is a model of acting on one's faith, despite the cost, despite the hopeful, hopelessness of the situation. There's a wonderful and pious custom in the church, one that certainly almost all of you have witnessed, and probably not a few of you have imitated, that constantly reminds us of St. Veronica's faithful witness. In the Divine Liturgy, during the Great Entrance, as the priest passes by with the Holy Chalice, the faithful may reach out their hands and brush their fingers across the edge of the priest Philonian. The priest, of course, is an image of Christ to us. And when we do this, we bring to mind this bold faith of St. Veronica. We literally touch the hem of his garment. The church puts this example of St. Veronica's faith before us in today's gospel lesson. We are reminded of her witness whenever we see and venerate this Mandelian icon. And we recall her when we touch the hem of the priest's garment at the great entrance. In these ways, the church is teaching us an important truth. The combination of divine grace and human will is explosive. It is what St. Paul refers to when he wrote that we are co-workers with Christ and that we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We have a contribution to make to our own salvation. This example of St. Veronica is an important one. She had nothing, but she approached the master with faith and she gained everything. After 12 long years of suffering without hope, her faith still lived. We are often faced with our own issues of blood, seemingly insurmountable problems that beset our lives. We become discouraged often at our own failures. We are tempted to say, like Jairus' servant says to him, trouble not the master. This problem is just too large. It's too late. We cannot give in to this temptation. Jesus Christ offers us life-changing grace. We have only to reach out with faith, like St. Veronica, to accept it. We must have the same single-minded determination to persevere, to do whatever it takes to touch the hem of his garment, bringing our issues of blood to him. 
May God give us the strength to do this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.